challenge. Thanks, Mobile Fire and Rescue, for having us down here. Really appreciate it. Great setup, good people. Had a good time last time, last year with you as well. But um, for those of you online, we're in Mobile. It's a convention center. If you're in the area, come out. We got lectures from 9 to 11. We got skill labs. We got four docs here. We're going to do surgical airways. We're going to do some mega code scenarios, advanced airway management. And then we're going to talk about some push dose epi and uh, other drugs of that nature. Uh, so if you're in the area, come on out for us. My name is Will. Um, I'm a, for those of y'all that don't know, I'm an ER doc out of Birmingham, Alabama. Um, my background was EMS. I took an EMT class, 90 or 91, and fell in love with the work. Um, so at that point, I went to the dark side. Did about 14 years of uh, ER and some flight nursing before going deeper in debt to med school, right? But uh, that's my background. Um, if you heard me say this before, I, I forgive me, but one of the reasons we started EMS Challenge back in 2014 was because I, my opinion that gets me in trouble a lot uh, is that uh, medicine ER docs are failing our patients and failing y'all as far as education. So the work that EMS does is medical care, doctor care in the field. There are things that the medics do, intubation, defibrillation, patient assessment, even the EMTs do, that really, uh, you know, you get two years of training at the most, and we've just kind of failed you as the way that we don't support you in education. So that's one of the reasons we started this. So um, you can see what challenge stands for, but the goal of this is to provide good con ed for you guys that's relevant and practical. You know, some of the textbooks, the material changes by the time it gets to printing. So this is laid back. If you have questions within reason, Feel free to ask. All right, we got a couple of smiles that time. So, a um, couple of updates. Uh, remember, uh, 12 leads, if you're doing those on your patients in the field, do them early, okay? Uh, hospitals are looking at our documentation now, which is great for EMS. Hospitals are being deemed, if they don't have first patient contact in the field, to time the EKG down to less than 10 minutes. So, the standards we have in the hospital are moving out in the field. It's, I won't say it's bad. It's going to be challenging for EMS agencies to capture that data, but it's good because now we have hospitals that want to look at our documentation. And if they want to look at ours, we already want to look at theirs uh, for kind of data sharing. So it's going to make it a lot better at some point. We're all in one big kind of happy EMR together. So 12 leads early and often. Capnography, um, any advanced airway, an ET tube, and IGEL should have waveform capnography. If you're running a BLS transport or an advanced EMT, kind of a tiered response, and you don't have waveform capnography, and you use an IGEL or a King Airway, no harm, no foul. You don't have the equipment. Buy a little bit of easy caps. We'll play with some of those today. If you're running ALS where you can intubate and you're using an IGEL or a King or a LMA, whatever you got, if you place that, you need to use waveform capnography, okay? Um, and for intubation, there's it's hard and fast. You got to do capnography. This is 2022. There's no reason to have a misplaced ET tube that's unrecognized. People die from those. So capnography, great for patient care. It also keeps you out of court. If you just document that you see waveform and put a number in your narrative, even though it shows up in the drop down boxes, that one line is going to stop somebody from reviewing the rest of your chart and call it a day. All right. Um, epi dosing, there's a national shortage of epi like everything else. American Heart pushes really hard that epi, the first dose in cardiac arrest, should be done as quick as you can, especially in kids. Second dose, the data kind of changes. Some folks are saying every three minutes, some every five, some every eight or ten. Some folks are actually taking epi, put it in a 250 bag of saline and running that as an infusion. Um, my thoughts, epi, first dose in cardiac arrest, as quick as you can. Get an EJ, get an IV. If you can't drill a patient, they have no pulse, give that first epi. All right, get the Lucas on, manage the airway, sit back, think about the H's and T's, and based upon what's going on with the patient, determine do they need an epi now at three minutes, five minutes, or can I go eight minutes? American Heart says three to five. Most places I'm working at now, I'm pushing it back to every five minutes for several reasons, but one of the reasons is we're running low on epi, okay? Uh, Narcan, anybody ever heard of that drug? Fairly new? That's a joke, people, right? Yeah, Narcan. Who's ever given Narcan to a patient before? Yes, right, yes. Everybody, yes. And the guy out there in the cleaning the yard, right? Everybody uses Narcan. Narcan used to be cheap. It's not cheap. I won't ask you what you're paying for it, but about 30 bucks a dose is a good price some places. Um, Narcan's pretty expensive, so be wise in your use for that. Um, years ago, we talked about we would titrate Narcan, so we'd give just enough to make the patient wake up and breathe a little bit. The problem is if we got EMTs and advanced EMTs using nasal Narcan, 
you only get about half the dose when you give it nasally, realistically, and it takes a little bit longer. So most folks are just giving the full dose nasally. So pretty expensive stuff. My thoughts on Narcan, if you run in a tiered response, EMS gets there, your EMT gets there, the patient is agonal respirations, they're blue, you do every management like any other time. Jaw thrust, OPA, nasal trumpet, passive O2, ventilate as needed, IGL or King, EMTs can do those now, all right? After you do that, and it seems reasonable to push the Narcan, give them the dose of the nasal Narcan. If one doesn't work, don't give any more, right? Either it's not gonna work or it's not enough, you're managing the airway, manage the airway. The other thing to think about is Narcan. If you got someone in cardiac arrest from an opioid overdose, nasal Narcan is not going to work. If you don't have perfusion going to your wrist, to your groin, to your neck, it's not going to your nose. So they need airway management, high quality CPR. They need ALS and that first dose of Epi. Okay. So Narcan, even though on TikTok, Instagram, all those things, everybody talks about how it's a miracle drug. It has its purposes. But remember, opioids make people not breathe, all right? And the next thing they do, it lowers the blood pressure sometimes. We should all be able to manage airways. ALS can manage that blood pressure. Does that make sense, sort of, kind of? No, all right, I got a few head nods, great. New drugs, who's carrying solumedrol now? Anybody carrying solumedrol? Sweet, yeah, so solumedrol is a great drug. Um, two patient populations to think about. If they're pregnant, you probably should avoid the solumedrol, okay? Uh, and diabetics, if you give somebody steroid and they're diabetic, it's going to make their sugar go really high. So my thoughts on the place, places I work, people I work with, if I have a patient, for example, that's bad asthmatic, huffing and puffing, really hard to breathe, I've hit them with four or five nebs. And in my mind, I'm thinking they're sick as dirt. I'm very concerned about their safety and they're diabetic and they're pregnant. They're still going to get solumedrol. We can fix those things at the hospital if need be. But if I got the routine guy that's got three or four NEB treatments, he's got to go to the hospital, but I'm not thinking he's crumping on me and he's diabetic and he's pregnant. <laughs> that's kind of funny. He's pregnant. All right, tough crowd. Um, he's not going to get the solumedrol for me. Get it, risk to benefit, right? If I'm looking at somebody and I think, holy crap, they're about to die, they're going to get the medications versus the ones that aren't looking that ill, okay? Toradol, who's carrying Toradol? Yeah, we have to, right? <laughs> who's using Toradol right now? Anybody giving Toradol yet in the field? What'd you give it for? Nobody's gonna answer, are they? So it's for pain, right? Yeah, so patient population you wanna avoid giving Toradol to. Um, old people, mature people, uh, Toradol is really bad on the kidneys. So if you got a 60 or 70 year old and you're giving them Toradol, there's a chance you could actually put some, get them into some renal failure with that, all right? Uh, pregnant people don't need Toradol as well. And then anybody with kidney problems does not need Toradol. Yes, Toradol is great for kidney stones. Stones hurt, they're from the devil. Toradol helps with that. But if they have underlying kidney disease, the kidney's not functioning well, and you give them Toradol, you got a chance to push them over the edge and they get dialysis, okay? What kind of patients have kidney problems in Alabama? You can't say kidney patients. What'd you say? Yeah, so if you got diabetes, you got hypertension, you're at risk for kidney problems. And who here sees people with diabetes or hypertension? Who here has hypertension and diabetes? Raise your hand. Nobody's gonna raise their hand but me. Good, all right, enough on that. So I wanna talk a few minutes about 12 leads. Uh, when EMS first started paramedic care, it was all about the three lead interpretation. Um, you're looking for your junctional rhythm, your heart blocks, your VTAC, your VFib, great stuff. We still gotta know it, very important. Uh, but when EMS first started, uh, when you had a heart attack, do y'all know what the hospital care for a heart attack was back in 1970? Yeah, we put you in the hospital. Yeah, we said, hey, we're gonna take all the good food away from you. Cut your cigarettes down from two packs a day to one pack a day. We watch you if you go into V-fib, we shock you. If you go into heart block, we try to fix you with medications and the outcome wasn't really good, right? Now we got things that we can do. We can send you to cath lab, we can do balloon angioplasty, we can give you thrombolytics, we can do heart surgery, all kinds of things. So now 12 leads are really important. Because now we've got this guy that could be having a massive heart attack on Monday, right? We recognize it. He goes, gets a cath, gets anticoagulated, and then Friday, he's back home with his wife and Saturday, he's fishing. So very important we do this because if we miss that heart attack on Monday, he's in the ground Saturday, right? So 12 leads are really important. So that's why I kind of push this on most fourth Wednesdays of the month. Um, 
People try to make EKGs way too complicated. There's vectors and angles and degrees. And yeah, I learned that one time and I re relearned it about every six months enough to sound like I know what I'm talking about to some of the docs I work with. Uh, but really a 12 lead is a screen tool. You're looking for madness, things that kill people, right? Um, I use a kind of pattern recognition to make sure that I'm not missing things because there's some days, just like some of you, I've worked all night and I'm tired or it's day five of a 12 hour shift and a call day uh, and I don't want to miss something. So I look at 12 leads, are they too fast? I like American Heart stuff they talk about, wide or narrow, regular or irregular. I use that pathway to figure out what to do with these people uh, and somebody with a symptomatic, uh, in a symptomatic patient with a 12 lead. If it's too slow, I think about drugs, electrolytes or ischemia, three things that causes it too much of a beta blocker or a calcium channel blocker, either an overdose intentional or they have kidney problems and they're older and they've been taking these medicines for years, but now they're just taking too much. They got to lower the dose, they get bradycardic. And then ischemia is another reason, uh, heart attacks, STEMIs, NSTEMIs, and electrolytes. What electrolyte makes you look get bradycardic and have a funky looking EKG? Potassium, yeah, so hyperkalemia. So those are the three things that I think about on a 12 lead that makes somebody bradycardic. Obviously, other things can make it happen. The six month old that is blue and breathing two times a minute and their heart rate is 50. What's their problem? What's making them bradycardic? Hypoxic, yeah. The dude shot in the belly talking to you on the way to the hospital with a heart rate of 140. Now it's 130, 90, 70. Now he's not talking. Now his heart rate's 40. What's going on with him? He's bleeding out. Yeah. What did you say? He's, he's dead. <laughs> okay, be politically correct, sir. Yeah. He's peri arrest, right? Yeah, um, but the point to that is anything else, my opinion, on a 12 lead that makes you bradycardic, you pick up in your primary exam. So if you're looking at your patient and trying to figure out what's going on, you can pick up the other causes. These three things you won't pick up without looking at the EKG itself. We can talk about things in the future that shows uh, what's going on with those folks. And then the last one is, is it okay-ish, right? So rates between 50 and 140, all right? Those are the scary ones. It's either a heart disease, a STEMI, Maybe it's uh, heart failure. Maybe they got a right bundle or a left bundle. Maybe they've taken too much of a tricyclic antidepressant. Maybe they're hyperkalemic. Those things you can all pick up on a 12 lead if you just practice a little bit with them. So useful information, right? So first thing I know is how to calculate a rate. Yes, I know the machine puts it at the top of the paperwork. I know it. you can look at the monitor and get that, but I always kind of think of a way you can do it. I use the box method. So I'm gonna look at a QRS complex and I'm gonna go next box is 300. 150, 100, and in my brain, my ADHD is already kicked in. I'm saying I don't care, don't care, don't care, don't care, don't care. When I get to box six or seven, I know it's way too slow, right? Intervals, you got to know your intervals, right? What is a long PR interval? What's a normal PR interval? Anybody remember from medic school? Yeah, 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 0.2, right? Yeah, or it says prolonged PR at the top, right? What does a long PR interval tell you? What's, what's the indication? What is that significance of it? Anybody remember? First three heart block, yeah. What do we do for first three heart blocks? What'd you say? Nothing? Yeah, yeah, supportive care, nothing, yeah, right. The big thing I think about when I see a first three heart block, a wide PR interval, is I go look at that QRS and if it's wide, I'm thinking, okay, that's a prolonged PR, a wide QRS, this could be hyperkalemia. OK, so knowing your intervals are pretty important, knowing what the QRS complex looks like, this narrow wide will kind of de determine whether you got a VTAC or maybe an AFib with a barency or something of that nature. And the last interval that's pretty important is the QT interval. So from Q to T, I usually look at the R to R and make it half of the, the QT should be half of that interval. Um, there are a lot of drugs that people take that prolong the QT. There are several drugs that we as EMS providers give that prolong the QT. And if we add those together and you get a real long QT, what can the patient have? Don't say QT-itis. What? What did you say? Torsades, right, torsades. And torsades kills people. So we got to recognize if I got somebody that's got a prolonged QT that's 80% of the R to R interval and I give them a certain drug in my drug box, big risk and then going into torsades and dying. What drugs prolong the QT interval that we give routinely in EMS? Yeah, okay, I'll take that one. Yeah, that's, a, that's an easy one. <laughs> Haldol, yes, antipsychotics. Haldol, what else can prolong the QT? You probably use it every day if you do a call. Zofran, Zofran prolongs the QT. 
Benadryl prolongs QT. All those drugs do that. And I'm not saying you get an EKG on everybody before you give that medicine, but you need to think about it. Are they at risk for long QT before we give those medicines? Because it's pretty cool when your patients talk to you and you give a Zofran and now they're in torsades. You get to like shock them and intubate them and do all those kind of fun things, right? But it's bad for the patient. So, sweet. All right, so first EKG, when I look at these, I look, is the rate too fast, too slow, or okay? Again, I would advise, please don't read the material at the top. Machines are evil. So I'm going to say 300, 150, 175, so 70 to 80. Yeah, it doesn't matter if it's 70 or 80. It's in that range, so I'm good with that. All right, so rate's okay. The next thing I'm going to look is I'm going to look for injury patterns. So I'm going to look at leads 1, AVL, then 5 and 6. These are my lateral leads. I'm looking for ST elevation. ST elevation, any two of these leads is a STEMI. Day is done, diagnosis made, I'm on the phone with the hospital, I got a STEMI, I start my care, right? So 1, AVL, and 5 and 6. Those look great. I move on down the road. 2, 3, and AVF, these are my inferior leads, looking for the same thing, elevation, all right? Next place that I look is I look V1 to V4. 1 and 2, your septal leads. These are your anterior leads. It's the middle part, left part of the heart, pretty important. I'm looking for ST elevation. Classically, we talk about you want two millimeters of ST elevation, one, one and a half in females. I usually just tell folks, look for one. If you got one, that's enough to make you uncomfortable in the right setting. Talk to the doc. If you got a STEMI system where you're working, put them in that as well. And I also look V2, 3, and 4 for ST depression. If I got T wave inversion, ST depression, this is a posterior infarct. Anybody heard about doing posterior EKGs where you take the leads off and put them on their back? Yeah, so you could actually do that here if you wanted to. Um, I don't do that in the ER. If I have a patient that is concerning for ACS and I have this information right here, I'm talking to cardiology and I'm going to treat them and they can make that decision. Is this a posterior or not? This is enough for me to say, yep, STEMI versus STEMI equivalent. They need to see a cardiologist, OK? Because if I'm right and it's a STEMI, I don't want to waste time. They should get to the appropriate care, all right? If I'm wrong, who cares? The guy's going to be OK anyway, right? Thank you. All right. Nobody's smiling at all. Last place I look is lead AVR. So you should be up in one, down in AVR. You know your leads are on appropriately, but ST elevation and lead AVR alone and depression anywhere else is concerning for left main disease. So if I'm up in AVR and I'm down inferiorly or I'm down laterally, one, AVL, five and six, that's concerning for a left main disease right there. And it's a STEMI equivalent. American Heart put that in the literature in 2013. So that means if the patient meets, meets the build of ACS, older risk factors, nausea, diaphoresis, chest pain, shortness of breath, syncope, that should make you think STEMI equivalent. They should see a place, a cardiologist, or go to a hospital that has a cath lab available. All right. Once I go through that, I go back, I look at my intervals now, and I look at lead two because it's usually easier. I'm looking at my PR, my QRS, and my QT. And my QT should be half the R to R or less. If my QRS complex is narrow, I'm done. I go back and I look at injury patterns one more time because there's some days I'm really tired and have not had enough of monster energy, right? So I go back, I look one more time, lateral, inferior, septal anterior, and I look at ABR to make sure I'm not missing something, all right? If the QRS is wide in lead two, I go look at V1, and I do that to look to see is there a bundle branch block, all right? So this one, I will say that QRS complex is wide. It's greater than 120, but it, it just view it looks wide. So I'm gonna go look over here at V1, and I'm gonna say, am I pointing up or pointing down? All right, so wide complex QRS, pouring down in V1. What is this, is that a left bundle or a right bundle? You can cheat and read the top. If y'all can see the top, I can barely see it from here. I mean, hey, y'all, see it? So it's a left bundle, right. Left bundle, right, <laughs> correct, it is left bundle. So QRS complex points down. You know, a long time ago, I learned about this, think about a turn indicator, right? So I'm driving along, left bundle, I'm turning to the left. QRS complex should be pointing down. There are a lot of mnemonics and schematics out there that kind of tell you how you can confirm this. Again, for me, the 12 lead is a screening tool. So there may be a situation where this is not, maybe it's some kind of other weird block, but for the most part, this is a left bundle. And that gives me a lot of information because there's some different rules for a left bundle for looking at heart attacks or stimulus.
What causes a left bundle branch block? That's anything that jacks up the left side of the heart. So left side of the heart gets enlarged from chronic hypertension, heart failure, from cardiomyopathy, from heart disease. As the heart gets bigger, the nerves in the heart, everything stretches out and it makes that conduction to the left side of the heart longer so that QRS complex gets wide. So Y complex says delayed conduction through there. And if it's pointing down in V1, you think left bundle, so the left side of the heart is jacked up for some reason, okay? Questions, comments, statements within reason? Wait, so you gotta have a QRS that's wide, greater than 120. There are a lot of different ways to diagnose this, all right? But I usually do Y complex QRS and a, a downward deflection of V1. All right, you can look in AVL and say no Q, it's kind of a backup. I usually do that as well, but for just a quick screen process, Y complex, downward deflection of V1 is what you're looking at. Scarbosis criteria, have y'all heard of that? So there's scarbosis, there's a modified scarbosis, there may be even a newer scarbosis, but the three gest to scarbosis is, if somebody has a left bundle, we used to say you cannot determine if they're having a heart attack, a STEMI or not. In reality, you can. That's why years ago, if somebody had a left bundle, we didn't have an EKG and they said they had chest pain, a lot of CARDS guys would go do a quick cath or would do other things or anticoagulate them. Now we don't do that as much. So concordant ST elevation. So if you got a QRS complex pointing one direction and the ST is elevated that direction, just like in any other EKG, that's a STEMI. Left bundle, right bundle, no bundle, right? If you got concordant ST depression, like a posterior MI, two, three, and four, same thing. That's a STEMI. The difference is in those septal anterior leads. So left bundles usually have a a little bit of elevation, V1 through V4 sometimes. You can see that. So that would make you think that's more than a millimeter. Maybe that's ST elevation. But in a left bundle, that's fine because you want discordance. You want the QRS complex pointing down, T-way pointing up, discord is good as long as it's not more than one big box. And that's the Scarbosa criteria in a nutshell. And those are the things that, they, at least for me anyway, I can keep those in my brain. I can remember those, all the other fancy ways to factor and calculate this. I can pull it up on my phone and look at it. But again, at two in the morning, when I got a sick patient, I'm not gonna do that. I'm gonna use this as a screen tool and figure out left bundle, got it. Is there Scarbosa present? Yes or no, does this make me uncomfortable, okay? So this is, the rate is okay-ish, it's not more than 150, right? So it's 300, 150, 100, so 100 to 120, that's still okay. I'm looking at injury patterns, one, AVL and lateral. This two-wave inversion should make me uncomfortable, but it's not a STEMI. Two, three, and AVF looks fairly reasonable. The EKG looks kind of funky, but it looks reasonable. V1 through V4, I got SC elevation in V1, V2, Maybe a hint in V3, that's not super concerning, but those two make me uncomfortable. I go look at AVR, AVR is opposite of one, that's good. No big elevation in AVR, all right? I go back and look at my intervals, I got a PR, PR interval, that's okay. My QRS is wide, so I go over here, it points down, so left bundle. So now I apply Scarbosa to where I saw this ST elevation. It's here, it's discordant, it's not more than one big box, so this is not a STEMI equivalent. Okay, thanks for not crossing your eyes. I appreciate that. The only way you get good at EKGs is to look at a lot. So if you're working in a place where you run 20 calls a day and you do 20 EKGs and you look at all those, you've probably got enough. If you're not doing that, you gotta find a way to look at more EKGs. There are a lot of places on the web. Life in the Fast Lane is a good EMS uh, uh, location for you. Wave Maven is another good one where you can kind of learn. It gives you a patient scenario. And then it gives you an EKG and you can look at that. But you gotta do a lot of these, like anything else, it's like IVs. If you start one IV a year, are you good at IVs? Probably not, right? Same thing, lots of EKGs. All right, let's look at this one. Too fast, too slow, or okay. Machine says it's 95, but 300, 150, 100, 75. So it's around 100, all right? One, AVL, five and six look reasonable. Two, three, AVF, it looks weird. 
but I won't say that's ST elevation. We got some kind of notch there, right? Right? V1 through V4, this should make you look at, get sweaty yourself and use profanity. That should make you uncomfortable, all right? Next place I look is AVR, no elevation, but one and AVR are opposite. I go over here, my peer interval looks good. My QRS is wide, so I go to V1, and now I'm predominantly pointing up. So what is that? Only thing left, right bundle, right? So that's a right bundle branch block. And the cool thing is, right bundle branch blocks, you should see this posterior change. So that's probably normal. So that should make you be more comfortable with this patient. Now, if they're sitting there diaphoretic, saying their chest is killing them, yeah, I'm still concerned because of the clinical picture, but not just because of the EKG. Does that make sense? Maybe. Wait. So again, every EKG, I look at it the same way. If you don't like my pattern, you're not going to make me mad, but find a way to do it the same way every time so that when you're tired, you don't miss stuff. When you miss stuff, you're going to feel bad about it. Trust me. So one, AVL, five and six, two, three and AVF, V1 through V4, I'm looking at AVR. Then I go back and I look at my intervals, right? And I recognize that's a Y complex QRS and I haven't even looked up here yet. I go back over, that's a right bundle. So I know that in a, in a complete right bundle, this is probably reasonable, okay? So yes, the patient still gets a workup, but I'm not as concerned about it. What causes a right bundle? Anything that jacks up the right side of the heart, right? So if this right side of the heart stretches out, it's gonna get delayed conduction through there. What are common causes of right bundle branch blocks? Anybody know? Anybody care? They may have a good joke. <laughs> so left-sided heart failure leads to right-sided heart failure. That's one, okay? People that smoke, people that have pulmonary disease, they have pulmonary hypertension, this right side of the heart pumps the blood to the lungs. If the pressure in the lungs is high, the right side of the heart gets really big, it stretches, and it delays conduction. What is something that can make somebody have increased pulmonary pressure immediately? So Monday, they look great, everything's good. Monday night, they got chest pain, and now they got a brand new right bundle, tachycardic, short of breath, chest pain. Anybody can think of what something that you can have in America? I guess that's a good way to put it. A PE, yeah, a PE, yeah. So you throw a PE, you're gonna have increased pressure on that right side of the heart. So you got a clot right up here. Every time the heart squeezes, it pushes against that clot, it can't do it. So you get right side heart failure immediately. If you look at it with an echocardiogram, that heart enlarges. So they're gonna be short of breath, chest pain. Now you got somebody with a new right bundle branch block. So you should be thinking about that. Why would a young, healthy person in their 30s have a right bundle branch block? What's the causes? Do they have some kind of underlying pulmonary pathology from childhood? Uh, have they been smoking since they were four, right? Or do they have a PE? Those are things that I'll be concerned about as an ER doc. I talked about that. Right bundle branch block. This is a little schematic that I found on the internet. It's uh, pretty cool. You can kind of overlay it on your EKGs and it shows you the injuries patterns. So elevation in AVR is at the aorta, so it can be your left and right, or left or right. One AVL, five and six is lateral. Two, three and AVF is inferior. V1 through V4 is your LAD, right? Kind of gives you an idea of what's going on. And if you've watched EMS Challenge, you've seen this a million times, and I apologize, but I gotta, I gotta push it. Um, don't let the machine do your reads for you. If you are a paramedic, you should be able to look at a 12 lead and say, STEMI or no STEMI. You don't have to say they have, oh, they have a right atrial appendage that causes, you don't have to do all that crap. STEMI or no STEMI, the things that matter, right? Don't trust your machine. What's wrong with this picture? What did the machine do wrong here? Yeah, the blood pressure. Can you have that blood pressure? I don't think that you can, right? So don't trust the machines. And my joke is we should have learned that from that movie in 1987. Or if you're really a science fiction dude, like 1981 from that movie, don't trust the machine, read your own EKG. Dr. Eversol, you like that one, don't you? That's when you were like in high school, I think. So, yes, sir. Sweet. All right, so first case, 47-year-old male, he's got nausea, vomiting, sitting there, pouring sweat. 
What do you think about this guy? What are you going to do for this guy? Give him a rag? Give him a straw so he can suck it up? <laughs> uh, that was funny. Okay. Nobody's talking. Yeah. So, are you concerned about acute coronary syndrome with a 47-year-old male, nausea, vomiting, diaphoresis? Yeah, he could be having a STEMI. He could be having pancreatitis. He could be just coming down off his crack. Who knows, right? So, I'm going to go sit down, introduce myself, lay hands on the guy, reach over, get a radio pulse. Somebody's going to be coming up, hook up to the monitor, we can get vital signs. You want a complete set of vital signs. Everybody in Alabama has diabetes, and AccuCheck is part of your vital signs. If it reads low, you know what to do. You fix it. Right. If you have D50 or D10, you can't find that anymore either. So if it says low, you give them a pack of Skittles. Right. If it reads anything between low and high, you don't care. And if it reads high, you know he's probably in diabetic ketoacidosis. Right. Cool. So quick set of vital signs. And then you want to get a history in those folks. And the history, when you get a history on somebody, is not to fill out the checkbox to put crap in there to, so you can say that you've got a good history. The history leads you to determine is this patient sick or not sick, and how fast do I work on it? If he said he had chest pain, he's going to get vital signs, and EKG for me, he's probably going to the hospital, right? But if he says he's got chest pain, oh, yeah, my, my dad died at 32 from a heart disease. I've had two heart attacks. My brain goes from thinking this is something minor to this could be really bad, so I move a little bit faster. Hey, go ahead and get some supplemental O2. Let's get the 12 lead real quick. Go ahead and bring the stretcher. We're going to start moving to the hospital because there's no way I'm sitting on the scene with this guy because he's high risk. Does that make sense? If he says, yeah, I get this every day. I've been smoking weed since 1982. When I don't smoke my weed, I get nauseous. All right. He's still going to get a set of vital signs. I'm still going to get a 12 lead. He's probably still going to the hospital. But in my brain, I'm not as concerned as I would be with the other scenario. Does that make sense? Your history should risk stratify your patient to determine what you do for them sometimes, and how fast you move. Sweet. So there are STMs, the stuff that matters for acute coronary syndrome. You know, family history, do you smoke? Do you have diabetes? Type ones are higher risk than type twos. Have you had a heart attack before? Things of that, that nature. Have you been smoking crack? Right, those things. There are STMs for shortness of breath. So if I got a 20 year old with asthma that's huffing and puffing, what are some important history questions to ask Liam? I hear voices in the back. Yeah, yes, cut to the chase. You ever been intubated before? If they say yes, at that point, I'm puckering and I'm sweaty because folks that have asthma and have been admitted to ICU or intubated have got about a 50% chance of that happening again. And even if you intubate them, they are horrible to manage on the ventilator. Those folks die. Right. So that should make you think profanity and start being really aggressive. That's the one that gets back to back nebs. They get O2. I'm already starting the line and pushing that solumedral. I don't care if she's pregnant, a diabetic or what. And I'm moving toward transport to get to the hospital where we have other drugs to do things with her. Yeah. She says, yeah, I have asthma. I get exercise induced asthma when I play soccer. You know, uh, you know, one day out of the week, I get short of breath. I'm still going to evaluate her. I'm going to get my vital signs. I'm going to listen. I'll probably give her a NEV treatment, but I'm not going to move with uh, a mission on her as much. Does that make sense? Cool. I like saying intubation. If you say ventilator, people will say yes, thinking that's the nebulizer. So I was asking that question, and everybody would have been ventilated. I mean, intubated. I'm like, oh my God, what's the problem? And I realized I was saying, Has any, have you been on the ventilator? And they thought that nebulizer was the ventilator. So I thought Birmingham had like a billion people have been intubated with asthma before. I'm like, this is crazy. I'm moving away. All right. Alternate mental, sta mental status STMs. OK, as you're doing your assessment, you're checking the ACU check. You can talk to family. Hey, any history of drug use? Have they ever had a stroke? If they've had a stroke in the past, that makes me think they can probably have another stroke. If they're altered and they have a stroke, it's probably blood in the brain. So be aggressive with your airway management, move toward the hospital with that. So that's why we get a history, okay? Then my other mnemonic I like is don't forget the underlying physiology pharmacology. And I usually tell a story about the uh, guy with the neck mask that had a bunch of blood. They couldn't control it with direct pressure. So the crew put an ace wrap on as a tourniquet to hold on his neck. So the bleeding stopped, but not for the reason they anticipated. So don't forget underlying physiology. All right, and I know for those of you that watch online, I'm choking to death talking about this stuff, but these are the things that are important. Don't get caught up and just filling in the boxes. So 
This dude, his dad had an MI in his 30s. He's a diabetic. He's on insulin. He occasionally does a little bit of cocaine. He says roll tide when he does that. <laughs> yeah, okay. That guy laughed. All right. And this is an EKG. I hear no one gasping. You don't even have to go through a mnemonic to look at this. Is this good or bad? Bad. That should make you pucker as well, right? So, again, I get tired. I don't want to miss things. Rate too fast, too slow, okay. 300, 150, 75, yeah, 60 to 80. I'm content with that. Rate's okay. One, AVL makes me gulp. That ST depression is super concerning. Five and six is elevated. So, in my mind, this is already a STEMI. Okay, I should have recognized it when I first looked at it, even without my glasses. Two, three, and AVF looks like tombstones or for the older dudes in the back, like Pac Man ghost, right? All right, V1 through V4, don't really care because I've been staring at that. Okay, I look at AVR, but I'm still staring at this. I look for in uh, intervals, I got a peer interval, my QRS is narrow, so don't need to go look for a bundle branch block. And I don't even have to put this one up and look at it a second time. STEMI or no STEMI? STEMI, right. So what are you going to do for this dude? Hugs. Protocol, I like hearing that. Protocol, what's the protocol say? Hugs. Yes, lots of hugs, yes. Actually, with monkeypox, I probably wouldn't hug people right now, but you can, right? Yeah, so he needs to, there's a lot of mnemonics out there. There's the Mona, the Fona, right? But you work these things backwards. So aspirin, platelet inhibitor, doesn't stop the clot from getting doesn't break the clot up, but it makes the clot not get bigger. Aspirin is very important. And STEMIs, if they say, yeah, I took an aspirin about an hour before you got here. I'm like, cool, thank you very much. Here's one more. I don't trust people. They could have took an Advil, a Lortab, a Norco, or something else. If I give them two aspirins, I'm not going to kill them. If I don't give them one, potentially I can make them not get better. All right? If he says, I got gastric ulcers, I'm, I'm crapping blood. I don't take aspirin. I'm like, yes, sir, I understand. Here's your aspirin. The only time I will not give this person the aspirin is if he says, last time I got aspirin, my neck swelled up. They had to cut me to put an airway in. No aspirin for him. Otherwise, risk to benefit, that's a big freaking stimmy. He's going to die. He needs aspirin right now. So aspirin, nitro for pain, if his blood pressure is good, start a line on those guys before you pop your nitro. That way, if they drop the blood pressure, you can fix that. All right. O is for oxygen. American Heart says we don't give people oxygen unless they're hypoxic or breathing fast. He wasn't either. So I'm not giving him oxygen because he's hypoxic or not breathing fast. I'm giving him oxygen because he is high risk of dying between his couch and the hospital. And if I got one or just two medics in the back of an ambulance and he starts to die going to cardiac arrest, if I already got the O2 on him, I got passive O2. I crank it up to 10 liters. I lay him back. I start ventilating. OK, he gets oxygen. All right. Morphine, if you got it and he's having pain, you want to use it, that's fine. The benefit from morphine is it lowers blood pressure and it makes him go from like, I got chest pain to I got chest pain, but I don't care, right? Turn on the doors. All right. This is my mnemonic that I like now. Is I think it's easy to remember. It's S-I-T-A-I-V-R-N-T-L-P-O-M. Y'all got that? <laughs> I'm just being silly. Um, but suspect, identify, treat, and transport. So suspect ACS in the patients that are high risk. Identify it, okay? Start your treatment as you move into the hospital, almost like trauma. We can do things for these people. Time is muscle, pretty important, okay? And then the AIV, I forgot what it is again, Chief. It's um, aspirin, IV, nitro. Oh, ride the lightning pads, oxygen, and morphine. So remember, people die and cur uh, from STEMIs for two things early on. They die from VTAC, VFib, or complete heart block. So if you got the pads on there and dude goes into VFib after his STEMI in the back of the truck, you put your cigarette out, you charge the 200, and you shock him. If you get him back, you take your cigarette and you smoke it and you finish out the trip. If you don't, then you start CPR and things of that nature, right? So everybody with chest pain doesn't get DFib pads. STEMIs get DFib pads. This is out of Birmingham. Dude having chest pain, big freaking STEMI, smart medic, IVs in, moving toward the hospital, throwing some O's on him, throw the pads on him, and the guy starts having a seizure. Does he get versed for that seizure? No, it's not a seizure. He sees him because his brain's hypoxic and he's jerking because he's in V-fib. So charge, shock, pulse back. 
Dude rolls into the ER, calling them mama names. He's cussing, but he's alive, right? So he gets sedated. He goes to the cath lab and has a decent outcome. S-I-T-A-I-V-N-R-T-L-P-O-M for your next tattoo on your arm, folks. That's what you want to put. <laughs> Ride the lightning pads. Um, other things to think about if you got your STEMI patient is ask them these questions. It's in the protocol book. I know nobody does it. Don't trick me, uh, but you should. Things you want to know. If the guy has a STEMI and he goes into V-fib arrest and you shock him and you do your work and you don't get him back, and he gets to me in the ER, and you show me this STEMI, and we're doing chest compressions, you've shocked him a few times, I can give him a drug, a clot buster, a lytic, to open up that vessel, potentially rescue him. And I need this data, because there are risks to giving somebody a clot buster. If he just had a hemorrhagic stroke two days ago, and I give him a clot buster, he's gonna bleed into his brain more and die. So there's no reason to give it to him. If he had recent spinal surgery, if he has some kind of aneurysm, if he has active GI bleeds, and I give him this clot buster, he'll die from that. So there's no point in trying that. I'm going to be more aggressive in my defibrillation, my antiarrhythmics, et cetera, et cetera. If he doesn't have those conditions, I can give him a dose of a uh, clot buster, uh, a, a TNK, Redivase, TPA, and there's a chance we break it up with that clot in his heart, and then our next shot gets him back. So this data is important to get because he's in cardiac arrest. I can't ask him. So as you're moving to the hospital, as you're throwing the O's on him, as you're putting the pads on him, do the important history things. Hey, man, you ever had a brain aneurysm, any recent cranial surgery, active GI bleed? If he says no, you're done. And you pass that information on to the hospital if he goes into cardiac arrest. When I give somebody one of these drugs, TPA, like we use for strokes, we actually use TNK for strokes now too, use for heart attacks. Any clot in the body breaks open and they're going to bleed like a pig. I guess you can't say that. They're going to bleed profusely any place they had a clot. I'll let y'all look at that one. Time's running low. I won't tell you. But go through it in your brain. And then who says STEMI? Raise your hand. Who says no STEMI? And who doesn't care? Nobody raises their hand. Who wants cash? from West Ward. All right, one person, she gets the cash. <laughs> yeah, so again, this should make you start squirming just looking at the EKG. If I go through my injury patterns and work it through, this is concerning, right? This is the septal anterior part of the heart, the lateral side. This guy is high risk for major uh, decomposition. Decomposition, that's not the word I'm looking for. What am I looking for? Thank you, very good, very good. I think I need some more caffeine. And decomposition, too. You're correct. Yes. Thank you. Yes. That's called death, right? Because I'm a doctor. I use big words. Yeah. <laughs> so if you throw this over it, it's the LAD, maybe the CERC. So high risk for a bad outcome. So this is his cath report. This is one of the benefits of sharing data with the hospitals is that if we agree to get these 12 leads early and tell them the times and what they look like, they agree to give us the cath reports and the outcomes on the patients. So we learn. Everybody gets better. So this is the still picture. He had a big LAD stenosis. They go in and put a stent, open it up, and he gets better. But he's got this little Duma hickey right there. It's called an impella, all right? So that's the device they put in over a wire into his left ventricle, and it helps suck blood out of the ventricle to deliver it to the rest of the body and push the blood back down by the aortic valve so that the heart itself gets better blood supply. It increases the pressure in the coronary vessels so the heart does better and it takes the workload off the heart. So our heart just had a big stimmy. That heart is tired, fatigued, just like you would be if you ran a marathon. So this is like getting the heart on a golf cart with Gatorade. So Impella works pretty good. It's a long catheter. This goes into the vessel, into the vessel, into the ventricle, and it sucks blood out. The rest of the body, the kidneys, the brain gets perfused. And then as it sucks it out, it pushes it back into those coronary vessels, and it works pretty good. So it would be in the left ventricle. It will come through that valve. It works pretty good. There's like a balloon pump. We still use those as well. The impella is easier. But balloon pump does the same thing. It's a big uh, catheter they put just outside the heart. And they deflate it so that the heart can pump the blood out easier. They inflate it and it 
forces the blood back into the coronary vessels so the heart does a good job. So if you remember the layman's term, what people talk about, those young guys that die from widow makers, that's a widow maker. They say that because people usually die from those. That's a big part of the heart that's jacked up. You gotta be aggressive. You gotta treat it like it's a trauma. Same as his, right? I guess that's just gonna go back and forth. All right, next case. This is a uh, 62 year old young female playing in the yard ER with family. Uh, family says she passed out unresponsive. They started CPR. You get there, she's sitting up saying, uh, I don't know why they called you. Life is good. What's going on? Um, so, what would you do for this patient? You can't say, Well, you sign here, I'm going to go, go back to the station. That's not the correct answer. Syncope is always an ALS transport, always. Syncope is a pre, is a warning sign that uh, I, I was almost dead, but I woke up, I got lucky. So syncope should always be worked up at the hospital because there are things we can find and save people. I get it, some people pass out just because, but there are things out there that kill people. So, oh man, the cat quit doing CPR. That's the best part of the whole thing. All right, so, you get your ABCs by getting a part in history. This ever happened before? Any heart disease, okay? Take any medication, smoke any cracks, nor any, smoke any fentanyl, right? I'm getting an AccuCheck. Syncope always gets a 12 lead. We're gonna assume our 12 lead looks fine, but on a 12 lead, you would look for AFib, a flutter. That would make you think, okay, they had a tachydysrhythmia or a bradydysrhythmia that made that happen. I'm looking for STEMIs. People who have heart disease will have, can have a STEMI, and the only symptom is every time I get up and start walking, I pass out. What's the problem, doc? It's because you're having a heart attack. That's the problem, right? So vital signs are fine. Heart rate is 80. Respiration is good. Blood pressure is great for Alabama, 190 over 60. All right? Pertinent questions, are you on blood thinners? Do we need to take you to the hospital to scan your head because you fell? They also did chest, uh, chest compressions on you. Maybe you got some busted ribs. But I'm going to do a good physical exam. Can you move everything? I'm going to listen to them. And there are not many times in life that I want to listen to heart sounds detail. But if I got somebody that has syncope and a murmur, that should make you uncomfortable. Murmurs only really matter from an EMS side or an ER side uh, a few times. So syncope and murmur should be concerning. What could be going on with somebody that was doing exercise, has a murmur, and syncopized? What could be going on with this chick? I hear a murmur. So cardiomyopathy can cause it. Yep, that's true. Yep. The other thing that I think about is aortic stenosis, right? So you got somebody that's got a stenotic aortic valve. That thing gets calcified, gets jacked up, so you can't pump a lot of blood out of it. So she does good just walking around doing regular stuff. But she gets up and starts exercising. The heart beats faster, the perfuser better, and it can't get the blood to that valve. So she passes out, loses the pulse for a few minutes. And it's not because she's in VTAC or VFib, it's just because the heart's beating so fast, it can't get enough blood out. But she passes out, loses the pulse, her activity decreases, and then she wakes up, okay? Um, these folks need to go to the hospital and get this taken care of. Emergent goals for you guys is to recognize it. So syncope patients, actually break out the stethoscope, dust it off, clean it off, uh, put a new thing on the earpiece, Listen for the murmur. If you got a murmur and they syncopized, you think in an adult, aortic stenosis. Aortic stenosis comes from chronic hypertension. It can also be congenital. But again, everybody in Alabama has hypertension. All right. So this valve gets stenotic. Can't pump blood through there. In the hospital, they can do a procedure. Um, almost like a heart cath, but they put the cath through the uh, aorta. And they go in and they dilate that valve. They can actually do cool things now and put artificial valves in there without doing open heart surgery. So it's pretty non-invasive now for the most part. So interesting things they can do, but we can't do this and fix it unless we recognize it. So syncope uh, on patients, always take a listen to the heart sounds. Another view, they stretch the valve open. And this is an inappropriate video I found on those valves. I'm not really sure what's going on there. But if you Google aortic valve, you get that video. It looks like some kind of alien resurrection thing, maybe. Uh, but all right. 
And kids, if they syncopize, you think about cardiomyopathy, right? So HOCAM, hypertrophic obstructive cardiomyopathy. I can't say those big words. Um, but that's the kid that's playing basketball, healthy kid, star athlete, and passes out on the court. And everybody thinks you're just goofing off. You go out and you check, he's got no pulse. That's HOCAM. That's because the left side of the heart is so constricted that he can't keep up with his outflow. Too much muscle, not enough ventricle, so not enough blood supply. All right. So this is the guy that passes out. All right. You start CPR. He goes into a dysrhythmia because of this. He gets the AD use. Again, you usually pick that up on a murmur. So syncope and murmur is bad. Do we have time for bonus points? Um, this is another murmur. This is a dude with a fever, a rash on his hands, and the hint from previous times was murmur, right? So he's got a murmur, he's got a fever, and he's got these rash on his hand, black dots under his nail beds. What's going on with this dude? Anybody know? Murmurs only matter a couple of times to me anyway. He's an IV drug user. Jason Eversol knows what it is. Dr. Eversol. He's got endocarditis, right? So you got this murmur. He's got pus on his heart valves. And every time they beat, you kind of hear it, right? And every time the heart beats, it's throwing flecks of pus. I got to be careful. Out. And they go to distal extremities, fingers, toes, noses, behind the eye. And you can see that, right? Little specs. So fever, rash, and a murmur is endocarditis. Syncope in a murmur is aortic stenosis. STEMI on the EKG, the patient clumping in front of you, hypotensive, heart block, looks like death in a murmur, is a ruptured valve because of the STEMI, and they need to see a cardiothoracic surgeon, not just a cardiologist. About this rash, what is this? No murmur here. Well, there'll be murmurs on the job site, but not murmurs in his heart. What is this? Is that after a girl? This is syphilis, right? So palmer rash. Somebody's got a rash in the palms. I'll shake anybody's hands. You got blood, you got crap on you. I don't care. I can wash my hands. If you got a rash in the palms of your hand, I'm not going to touch you. You get a fist bump or you get an elbow bump. I'm not catching syphilis from shaking hands. No way. So that's syphilis. Right. That's hand, foot, and mouth disease, palmar rash. Usually that's uh, painful for the kids. Adults can catch this. So if your kids get it, don't think you won't get it. Avoid them. Let your spouse take care of them or your partner. What about this rash? What is this rash? Yeah, this is in the news. This is the popular one these days. Yeah, this is monkeypox, right? Sweet. So the, initially, people were talking about that monkeypox is an STD, and yes, it is. But it's also, it's, you catch it from close contact. So we're seeing some of this in daycares, okay, in group homes, things of that nature. Um, just a few other pictures. In the past, we learned, while well, I learned in med school that this was systemic. You would say, is it monkeypox or smallpox? And you would say, I hope it's monkeypox and not smallpox. And that's how you diagnosed it. <laughs> that's not really funny. Um, uh, but we're seeing uh, just a few lesions on people or a lot of lesions. Most of them do well. It's just you don't want it, right? But it's in the past, folks also had a viral syndrome and then uh, had the rash. Uh, but it's kind of weird this time. We're not seeing that all the time. This is from the state uh, uh, ADPH about risk of transmission. You can Google this and they'll tell you things you should and should not do. I'd recommend that you all look at that. It's kind of funny in a not funny way. We won't go over that rash. All right, last EKG case. This is an older lady passed out uh, at church while dancing. Uh, so what do you do? Obviously, ABCs where you're getting your history, pertinent histories. Hey, you're on blood thinners. You're diabetic. This ever happened before. She's syncopized, so I'm going to get a 12-lead. I'm going to listen down to her heart, check out for a murmur, right? I'm getting an Accu check on her. She's a little tacky for 80 in the 90s. Respirations are 22. Blood pressure is fantastic, 102 over 64. She's not hypoxic. Glucose is 102. I'd pay money for that. All right. We've done our STMs, and we get a 12 lead. Too fast, too slow, we're okay. That's a little bit fast, it says up here, right? 
Now that's the Pierre interval. So it's not too fast. So 300, 150, 100, 75. So between 70 and 100. So rates okay. I'm gonna look at injury patterns. I'm gonna look at one AVL five and six. That should make you uncomfortable. It's not a STEMI, but it's T wave inversions. Two three and AVF. I look V1 through V4, and I look at AVR. I'm gonna go back and look at my intervals. Pierre interval is fine. QRS is fine. QT is reasonable. So anything concerning on this EKG? It's got to be. I showed it to you, right? I mean, I'm not going to show you a normal EKG. That's kind of silly. Yeah. So this chick is up in AVR, ST elevation and lead AVR, and she's down laterally, right, and inferiorly. So she's got ST elevation and AVR, depression everywhere else. So you think about left main disease. So that's the STEMI equivalent. We should be thinking about, do she need to go to the cast center or what else is going on? But then we also want to ask more questions to figure out because 80 year old people have bad heart disease at baseline, regardless of what they tell you. So maybe she's just having some other injury that's making her have that elevation in AVR. So this lady actually said she's just having some, uh, she's anticoagulated, she has heart disease, and she's been boo-booing a lot. Anybody know what boo-boo means in the deep south? That kind of boo-boo? That means that, doesn't it? That kind of boo-boo, yeah. She'd been pooping blood. So they're like, whoa, wait a minute. She actually looked pretty pale. Check some labs. She was actually fairly anemic. So her reason that she was having that STEMI equivalent is because she was anemic from dehydration and crap and blood. But you'll see that AVR go up and that depression lateral pop up. When we gave her a couple of units of blood, EKG normalized, okay? Now, for you guys in the field, you can't check anemia, right? But you can get that history. So when you come to the hospital, hey, 81 year old female, syncopized, EKGs up in AVR, no murmur. She says she's been crapping blood and she's anticoagulated. So me, I'm gonna say, okay, cool. I'm gonna come look at her before I start calling cardiology and getting some labs before I start thinking about giving her more blood thinners and going to the cath lab. STMs. All right, questions, comments, or statements? Um, I show this slide most times. Um, I got three rules in, in healthcare that I try to go by. Is one, I don't want to kill people. Uh, the things that you guys do, the medicines you carry, the procedures you carry, you can kill someone for those things. Uh, the way you prevent that is you train. You train, you get feedback, you train, you get better every time. I try and help people. And there's some things in uh, healthcare that I can recognize, but I can't treat. If you have a head bleed, a subdural hematoma, I can recognize that. I can figure it out. But if I take you to the OR, you will die. Hands down, right? Just like you guys. Y'all can figure out some things. Some things you can't do. I get it. We're all that way. So I try and help people. And then the last thing is I want to go home with a clear conscience. Healthcare is ever-changing. Even if you do everything right, people die. We all die anyway, right? Um, uh, but the way I meet these three rules is I train continuously. I study. I get feedback. I recognize when I make a mistake. I don't make it a second time, okay? Um, if you don't train, you don't prepare, people get hurt. I like this slide because if you recognize there's an EMT and a physician and the physician has bigger arms, that is me. OK, just so you all know, that is me. OK, and then this picture over here uh, on your right, um, calling EMS providers, healthcare providers is like calling this dude a day laborer, right? Yeah, I get it. He's doing the job, but he's doing it out on a limb, right? So I appreciate the work you do. Healthcare physicians, we should be these people holding you up and we've been failing you and we're trying to get better. All right, questions, comments, statements. I got 18 seconds. Yes, sir. Um, I think that is gonna be deeper in detail. So my, my goal for the, this program is that we get STEMI, no STEMI. And then for the folks who wanna get deeper, that's fine. But for now, I think this is where we need to be. If we all get here, I can stop and have a drink. Sweet. Other questions, comments, statements? All right, let's take about a four or five minute break, Chief. Is that good, sir? And we'll see y'all in a few minutes. Thank you. Been oils on him and pressing on him and doing stuff, and he miraculously came back to life, and that was newsworthy. Um, but really, before that, there's no there's no published anything about resuscitation at all. It's just if you look dead, you were dead. So after that, there were some various questionable techniques used for resuscitation. This was actually a real technique where they would blow tobacco smoke up your bum. Um, 
So if you think anything that I'm saying to you today is uh, a bunch of malarkey, just remember I'm, I'm probably ahead of my time here, okay? I'm not just blowing smoke up your butt. Um, so post-resuscitation care is something that is, it's, it's important, but I feel like it's really underemphasized in the current model that we use to teach pre-hospital care now. Uh, we focus really, really heavily on getting ROSC back, right? When we went through EMT school, you do these mega codes and you go, cool, I'm going to give this drug and I'm going to shock them, I'm going to do this. And then at the end of it, they'll say your patient has ROSC or your patient died. And that's the end. That's the end of the scenario. And you never go, okay, now what do you do? Like, what's the next step? Um, I have a cool story that I wanted to share because it was one of the, uh, we all have a, a handful of moments in our careers where it, it kind of is the way it works in the movies, you know, like the public thinks that Grey's Anatomy and all these shows, you know, someone falls out on the floor at the train station and they do five compressions and they're like alive and awake and they're good. And it never works like that really. But um, I was on Rescue 7 um, out in Theodore. It was part of the USAR team at the time. And our assignment that day was to go and teach um, an extrication class at Barry's you pull it. So we had several cars we were going to cut up and run the recruits through these evolutions. And as we're doing these evolutions, a guy comes running out of the parts yard and he goes, somebody back here needs help. And then turns around and runs off. I'm like, okay, good deal. So we grab our stuff, we get the bag, we get the monitor and we kind of walk over. And as I turn the corner, I see a guy doing compressions on a person on the ground. All right, that's not good. They said, you know, this is my buddy. We we're looking at something. He just fell out. I was like, cool. And as I'm listening to the story, we're getting the pads on this guy. We turn the monitor on. He's in V-fib. Boom. Lit him up. He jumped back in V-fib. But hang on. Boom. Lit him up. Normal sinus. And I was like, oh, man. I was like, that was pretty cool. And I looked up, and that entire recruit school was right there. And their eyes were all like this big. And I'm sure my eyes were about that big, too, because I was like, oh, what the heck am I supposed to do now? Um, so kind of looking back on that and looking, you know, that, that obviously was a good outcome. Um, there were things that I could have done better. And, and I'm guilty of replaying this stuff, like all these scenarios. You get a patient, you know, they're sick, and you bring them to the hospital. And, and you think about that later on that day, or you think about it, as you're driving back to the station and you're going, oh man, you know, I could have, maybe I should have tried here for an IV first, or maybe I should have done this or that. You kind of replay that. And that's normal. Um, and so, you know, I did that and I just didn't know a whole lot about what I could have been doing better. And so that's what I really wanted to hit on today is, is what do we do after we get ROSC back? Okay. So this is straight out of the, um, 10th edition of the protocols. This is the new stuff. In the 9th edition, we actually had a ROSC protocol in there. Um, it says if you get return of spontaneous circulation, do these things. Um, in the 10th edition, that has been rolled into the shock protocol, which is this. I'm sorry, I don't know if you guys can see this. This is straight out of the protocols. Um, up at the top, it starts with supplemental oxygen. And Ferg talked about oxygen a little bit in his last lecture. Um, supplemental oxygen does not have to mean blast them with 4,000 liters a minute of oxygen on the way. You know, it, it, we're going to talk specifically about how oxygen free radicals can cause a secondary phase of, of cellular injury. We'll hit on that a little bit later on. Um, but I'd really like for us to get to a point where after we have the patient like well oxygenated and they're perfusing to get comfortable turning that oxygen down a little bit and making sure their sats are okay, but we're not just overloading them with the oxygen. Um, Bird did a great job talking about the 12 leads and the EKGs, going over the reviews. Um, it's so important to get those early into the hospital and, and different hospitals have some different protocols. Some places will not activate the cath lab until they see that 12 lead, the sooner they can get that, the sooner they can notify their interventional guys and get people down there, we can get these patients up to the cath lab. Um, this is a shock protocol, so it says cardiac monitor. Uh, if, you have, if you have put a patient in cardiac arrest on the monitor and for some reason taken them off the monitor, this is a reminder to put them, please God, back on the monitor. <laughs> you have bigger cojones than I do if you made that decision. Um, Get IV or IO access. This guy that you know we, we resuscitated in the junkyard, 
we didn't have any of that stuff done. We shocked him twice and got Rosk. It was like, oh, shoot, you know, now we have to do all this stuff. Um, this is also really important when you get Rosk and you start to get some kind of pressure back in the vessels. It makes those IVs a little bit easier to get in. It's so hard to do it with those flat veins. Um, so take that opportunity to get big IVs put in and set up. Um, there's like a 20% chance, a one in five chance that your patient is going to rearrest. So this is your opportunity to get things squared away so that you're ready next time their heart stops, you're ready to go ahead and slam that epi and shock them and do whatever it is you need to do. Um, because this is a shock protocol, it's asking you to give some fluids. Uh, you, you know, plus or minus giving them fluids. Um, if it looks like they need fluids or if they're a little hypotensive, that's fine. Give them fluids. Um, ultimately, if, if they are not maintaining a blood pressure, can I get an amen that we have pressors not named dopamine anymore? So now we have some new tools. Um, your go-to for situations like this um, is probably going to be the norepinephrine or uh, epinephrine. Um, so you still have dopamine. Um, that was always one of the really intimidating things for me as a medic to set up because it's not something you do frequently and there's all these weird dose ranges and things. Um, I would take this opportunity now to remind you that there is a dopamine calculator that is already in the protocol book. So if you just open it up to dopamine, it says put the dial of flow at this number. And then you can really, this is what I didn't understand, is you can titrate that number up or down, right? So you're like, oh, the pressure is getting a little low. I need to give them more dopamine. Cool? In, in terms of airway management, when, when we do talk about supplemental oxygen, um, this is not, for those services who are doing RSI and things, this is not someone I would necessarily jump to RSI. They're already pretty hemodynamically fragile. If you can bag them with a BVM or a King or an IGEL, I would just prefer to do that um, and not, not RSI them at, at the, that immediate ROSC point, okay? All right. So, has, has anyone seen this curve? It's new for everybody. All right. So these are these are our numbers. Um, if you have an out of hospital cardiac arrest, um, about seventy percent of the time you're going to die. Just that's it for you. About thirty percent of those patients, we will get ROS going. Okay. And everything that we focus on is um, is this laser work. Yeah. Right. So all the interventions we're doing, we're shocking them, we're pushing meds, we're doing all that stuff. We're focusing on this part right here of the curve. And then we get ROSC, okay? If you get ROSC, about 10% of those people are actually going to survive to 24 hours. If you make it to 24 hours, it's a coin flip whether or not you get discharged from the hospital. That doesn't mean you walkie-talkie out of the hospital and you're normal in life is fine. That means you're discharged from the hospital. It does not mean you're neurologically intact. Okay. Um, so the numbers are not great. There's a ton of room for improvement. Despite a lot of the interventions and things that we've done, we've not been able to make a huge impact on this curve so far. Um, so we work really hard at fixing this. These are our early interventions. These are the meds and drugs and things that we push. What we're talking about today is fixing this part of the curve, okay? The patients that we do get back, how do we preserve what they have? This is the chain of survival. Um, I think they talk about this or teach this like in all the CPR and ACLS and you know all the AHA classes. Um, but those first four things in the chain are all in that, you know, that first part of the curve early activation, early defibrillation, early CPR, all those early interventions. That guy in Theodore that fell out, he was a witness arrest. We were literally like 100 yards away with a defibrillator. A guy started jumping on him and doing compressions. Like that worked the way it was supposed to work. That's how it's supposed to go. This is a paper that is almost 20 years old, published in 2005. They said, hey, listen, post-resuscitation care is could be the missing link in fixing this curve and fixing these people. And at the time, if you see this little thermometer probe here, they said, what we need to do is take these people and initiate therapeutic hypothermia. We need to take them and chill them. And we think that's gonna help fix this curve. 
this is when they really started to emphasize this post resuscitation stuff. Now, this paper is 2005. I still feel like it, we've done a poor job of trickle down all the way to the field, uh, which arguably to me is the most important thing um, because this is out of hospital arrest, right? It, it makes sense that the out of hospital providers would be the ones who should be the best at this, right? Um, so in order to understand what we need to do better, we have to talk about the pathophys of what happens to your body when your heart stops beating. So what happens when oxygen stops moving through your body? Cardiac arrest results in whole body ischemia. And whole body ischemia results in something called post-cardiac arrest syndrome, PCAS. We'll just call it PCAS from here on out. Um, there are four components that have been identified that we can sort of attack to get better at. Um, the first is the brain injury. So I'll spend the most time of those four things talking about brain injury just because there are a couple of different components of it. And the brain obviously is the most important organ in the body. If you don't have it, if it dies, it's just done. The brain is the most exquisitely sensitive organ in the body to hypoxia. So it is the greediest organ. Um, it's going to take up more oxygen than anything else, and it's going to be more sensitive anytime there are hypoxic conditions. In 20 seconds, the oxygen stores in that tissue are depleted, and in about five minutes, the ATP and the glucose are gone. Okay, You don't have a tremendous amount of time. So when that happens, so <laughs> please don't memorize this. Every time I feel like I put a picture of a cell membrane up here, people have like PTSD about something. Don't memorize this. I'm not going to ask you to recite this stuff. This is just a reminder that the first two things that we're going to talk about, they happen on this level. OK, we're talking about stuff that happens on this microscopic level. OK, so the first thing that happens, right, your heart stops and you get a hypoxic injury. You quit getting oxygen that flows to those cells. What happens when you get hypoxic? is your neurons in your brain are going to have a, um, a disruption of the resting membrane potential. That's going to cause a bunch of calcium to come into the cell, and it's going to cause depolarization. That depolarization leads to the release of a bunch of excitatory neurotransmitters like glutamate. Okay, If you release a bunch of excitatory neurotransmitters that say, do more stuff, get really you know hopped up, that's probably bad in hypoxic conditions, right? Can you see how that snowballs on itself? And so now you, you've got this perpetual snowball that you've built. Um, on top of that, you're making the hypoxic injury worse um, and you're increasing the risk for seizures because you're releasing all these excitatory neurotransmitters, okay? Um, if your ROSC patient looks like they're having a seizure, so oh, cool, I got a pulse, we're good to go. And, and Ferg touched on this in his lecture as well. And you go, oh man, they're having a seizure. Okay, check their pulse and make sure they're not re-arresting, all right? Check their pulse and make sure they're not re-arresting. If they still have a pulse, cool, treat the seizure. Make sure they're not re-arresting, okay? So that's the first phase of the injury. So that's what happens when the heart stops. You have that hypoxic injury that's driving this excitatory neurotransmitter release. And then you get there and you do all the early inter intervention things and you get ROSC back. And there's a second phase of injury. Now that phase, after the heart is beating, you're returning oxygen back to those cells. You're actually going to get a free radical mediated damage directly to the membrane of the cell wall from the oxygen free radicals. Okay? That's going to directly injure that cell wall. That injury is just like any other injury in your body. All of a sudden it requires an immune response. So our immune system kicks in and it goes, oh, we need to get immune cells there. That causes swelling, okay? Um, that swelling, your brain, right, is bad. That's going to lead to cerebral edema and herniation, okay? Now, oxygen is a dose-dependent thing. That does not mean if you put them on 100 liters or whatever and you transport them to the hospital that you've now devastated their brain and they're going to herniate and die. This is something that we need to do pre-hospital, but also has to be carried through in the hospital phase after you turn them over to us in the ER. Um, what I ideally would like is to have them titrated between 92 and 98%, okay? 
if I see 100% and we've got them, you know, intubated and everything, I can go ahead and start working that oxygen back down because at that point, they're well oxygenated, right? What's the difference in 98 and 100%? like their body, their tissues are getting the oxygen that they need. We can start to turn that down. Um, and I think it's important to get comfortable doing that. I remember when I first started in the field as a medic, you had two options. You were getting two liters on a nasal cannula, or you were getting like 50 liters a minute on as high as I could make a non breather go. And that was it. Those were your two options. And so being comfortable turning that down and switching, going, hey, listen, you know, you're, you're on six liters. Let's take you off this non breather. Let's put a nasal cannula on, see if we can work you off this oxygen totally okay. Um, I understand that there's a difference, you know, I know in Mobile, our transport times are not long. They're short transport times. We're not going to have time to do a lot of this stuff, but in agencies that have longer transport times or in agencies that are doing transfers, you're picking someone up from one of these hospitals and bringing them to another one. That is something that you're going to get to work on, okay? If you're with these patients for longer than half an hour, that's something that you need to be kind of working on getting their oxygen down. Does that make sense? Some membrane picture didn't glaze everybody over, right? All right. Okay. If we zoom out a little bit, so we were on that microscopic scale, okay, real small, and we're still talking about the brain. If your patient was down for longer than 15 minutes, they're going to develop little tiny micro infarcts. So these are just little tiny strokes, okay? Small vessels, not big vessel strokes. And this isn't just happening in the brain, it's happening all over the body, okay? Obviously, we're talking about the brain. The brain is important. We don't want a bunch of little tiny strokes in the brain. Um, in animal models, when they have studied this, this is responsive to lytic therapy, the clot buster therapy. That's not part of the typical traditional therapy that we do now, um, but it is something that that is kind of on the cusp and on the future and worth um, looking into. So there's research into this right now. Um, to see if it's a viable thing. Now, like what Farg was talking about, if you've got someone who arrested because they had a big PE, you're going to push those clot busters anyway. And that actually would help if they were down for longer than 15 minutes with these microinfarcts and reperfuse those small portions of the brain, okay? Um, there's really no way for us to tell how bad that injury is until several days after. Uh, we would have to do an MRI to really neuroprognosticate and see how bad that brain injury is. But this is another... Um, this is another thing that we can kind of attack and go, I think if we can make this better, like we can improve outcomes. Um, if we zoom out on sort of a global scale, you know, so we talked about small stuff that happens. We talked about small infarcts that happens. And now this is sort of a global thing that also affect your brain injury uh, during the recovery phase. So um, your temperature. We've got a few slides after this. We're really diving into the temperature. Who is not, who's never heard of therapeutic hypothermia? Dr. Fur, <laughs> perfect. <laughs> um, so that, uh, that was a relatively new thing. It's, it's really started in about 2002. I've got a few slides, we'll dive into that. Um, but preventing fevers is important, okay? Um, people who do have fevers after this, they have uh, worse brain injuries and a worse prognosis after the fact. Hyperglycemia. Uh, if you go back to that uh, shock protocol, I think in there it says check blood sugar. I don't care if their blood sugar is low so much. I mean, I want that information and we can fix that, but it's also really helpful information and not something that I was used to doing in the field going, oh, their blood sugar is 270. Like for me, that was not, super useful information to convey. You know, I could say, oh, you know, I got their sugar and it was 270 or whatever. Um, anything really over 200 in these ROSC patients, I'll treat. Like, if you have blood sugars higher than that in this phase, that shows worse brain injury um, and they have a worse prognosis. And so we're really aggressive about treating hyperglycemia, just like we are about treating hypoglycemia. Um, and then seizure, we talked a little bit about how uh, that hypoxic injury causes that release of glutamate, and you're more likely to have seizures. Uh, once these, these patients are unresponsive, when we bring them into the hospital, we put them on an EEG. Um, and so we're actually monitoring their brain waves in the ICU. We can actually see if they're clinically having a seizure or not. Uh, we're very aggressive about treating those seizures just because um, I, I do a whole seizure lecture. I'm very passionate about seizures as well. 
Um, but we want to be very aggressive about how we treat that because the sooner we catch it and make it stop, the best chance that we have a better chance of preserving the brain that's left. OK. All right. A little bit about um, the therapeutic hypothermia. So. This really started in 2002. There were two papers that were published in the New England Journal um, that basically said therapeutic hypothermia, like if you have an arrest and you get a heart rate back, if we take you and we chill you, if we bring your body temperature from 37 Celsius to 33 Celsius, you do better. And they had some data to back that up. And so the AHA, the American Heart Association, they looked at that and they said, we give this a class one recommendation. This is a thing that we need to be doing. Other examples of class one recommendations from the AHA are like the rate and depth of CPR. So like th this is a very strongly recommended thing from them. Okay. I said, this is a thing that we need to be doing. So these hypothermia programs popped up all over the country. And this, this was, you know, what all the major cardiology groups decided that we needed to do. Um, and so we would bring these, you know, come, we don't do this to people who are awake. So the guy that I resuscitated in Theodore that, you know, pretty much immediately woke up kind of thing was not a candidate for this. But people who remain comatose after ROSC, this is where they go. This is their pathway. OK, um, has anyone had the opportunity to see this? OK. Yeah, you have where one of the hospitals here. Yeah, yeah, you got some patients up there on it. Yeah, perfect. So, um, it, for those of you that haven't seen it, I'm sorry, the screen might be a little small, but um, we have a catheter. So, we have, well, let's see here. There we go. Maybe you see that a little better. So, you have a catheter that goes in your body. This has to go into a big central vessel. So, you know, a subclavian vein or a femoral vein. Um, and it's just like a really, really long IV. And there's a sheath on the outside of it that has balloons, kind of like an ET tube, how you can inflate the cuff. It's the same kind of thing, except that instead of pushing air through that balloon, we've got water that can flow through. And so um, there's two ports on the sides. Water goes in one and it fills up the balloons and then it comes out the other side. And it basically is a heat exchanger. And so it, it basically pulls the heat from your body into the water the water flows back into this device here, which has a little reservoir of water in it and a heating and cooling element so that we can control the temperature. And I just push a few buttons on the monitor. I set the temperature. It makes the water whatever temperature I set it, and then it just runs. And so those balloons go up through your IVC. So it's a real, it's a real good central cooling device. Um, they're big. So that's, I'm actually putting this one in. Um, you can see kind of how long it is and it goes up to the hub here so it goes in from here to here it's a it's a pretty big line um but we can also use it as a central line it's got other ports that we can push medicine and fluids and we can draw blood and things like that from it but it goes into a vein so since 2002 that's what we've done until last year and then last year this paper came out that said you know what we did kind of a head to head thing. We had people that we took and we made them really cold. And then we had people that we took and we just made sure they didn't have a fever. And it turns out those people did better. No one really understood why the therapeutic hypothermia worked. And so there were all these ideas that got thrown out and it's all the stuff that we just talked about. They're like, well, maybe it protects the cell wall from oxygen free radicals and maybe it prevents metabolic demand from the hypoxia. And so all the stuff that all the little things maybe it prevents these micro infarcts, all the stuff that we just talked about, they were like, maybe that's how it works. Um, and no one was really able to like prove an exact mechanism. And as it turns out, what the new science with this paper from last year says is basically, I think we're doing really good by not letting these patients get a fever, by preventing fever, um, not necessarily chilling them, we're getting better outcomes. And so None of the major groups have updated their guidelines yet. So if you read guidelines right now, the guidelines are all still going to say do the hypothermia. But with the new science and the next time those those groups meet to update their guidelines, I suspect that they're going to shift more to a fever prevention model than a hypothermia model. Does that make sense? So there's still going to be a place for those lines and putting those in. But the reason for that is going to be keeping them 
at a normal temperature and preventing a fever versus chilling them. Okay. Everybody cool with the brain injury stuff? That that's kind of the biggest thing. We can springboard from a lot of that science and kind of talk about some of the other stuff. Any questions about that? All right. All right. So uh, the next the next thing the component of this that we have identified that we can sort of attack or at least to be aware of is this myocardial dysfunction. Um, I thought this was pretty interesting. So you have cardiac arrest and your heart doesn't beat at all, and then you get ROSC. Um, and we have something called something called an ejection fraction. So that is the percent of blood in your left ventricle that gets pumped with each heartbeat out of your left ventricle into your aorta through your body. And a normal is 55%. So 55% of the blood that gets pumped into my left ventricle makes it out of my heart with a heartbeat to go to the rest of my body, okay? One of the interesting things that we see is after we get ROSC, your heart actually tends to overshoot that and you wind up somewhere in that 60% range. Let me pause for a second and say, this is in people who did not arrest because of an AMI. This is people who did not arrest from like a heart attack, okay? This is people who arrested from a PE or sepsis or you know respiratory failure, something like that, okay? In, in these people, when you get ROSC, their heart will actually rebound. You'll get a transient increase in their ejection fraction. That happens over about 30 minutes, okay? So if you're in the field, you get ROSC, and you're in the hospital in 10 minutes, great. You don't have to worry about this, okay? Now, from 30 minutes to six hours, that function gradually declines, okay? So if you've got a two-hour transport, or a hospital calls you and says, hey, listen, we got this patient that arrested like two hours ago. We need you to bring them two hours away to this hospital in Montgomery somewhere. Okay, cool. And all of a sudden you're transporting and you're like, man, their blood pressure is not doing great. Like, what is going on right now? Um, you got to consider that they could be in cardiogenic shock. Their ejection fraction is now 20%, you know. Um, the good news is first of all this is transient if we can get people through this if we can support them through this they're going to get better on their own after two or three days the heart's going to return to normal that's great it, it displays this myocardial stunning it's a phenomenon no one really knows why it happens but it gets better on its own the other thing is that we have medicine that can fix this right we've got press that we really need inotropes for this so stuff like do like dobutamine or milrinone um if you're really really sharp and you get called to a hospital to bring one of these patients somewhere else, it's not unreasonable to be like, what about starting a dobutamine drip and we can kind of titrate that up or down as we need to and just have something um, ready in case you need it. Um, it's really important to note that this is cardiogenic shock, okay? If you go down that shock protocol, the first thing it says is give uh, like a liter of IV fluids. That's gonna make these people worse. These people need inotropes, not fluids, okay? Um, you'll see in just a second, we'll talk about a distributive kind of shock and it's important to distinguish between the two. Cool? All right, the third component of this that we can attack is a systemic ischemia. I mentioned when we talked about the brain injury stuff, like that's not exclusive to the brain. Every cell in the body feels that hypoxia. It's just the brain is so sensitive to it, right? But every tissue in the body, the adrenals, kidneys, lungs, liver, everything else is still going to be hypoxic, okay? This is sort of the cascade of events that happens. You go into an oxygen jet, you get hypoxic, and then you have endothelial activation. That's why you get these microinfarcts. So the endothelium is just the lining of the inside of the blood vessel. It's the part of the blood vessel that the blood actually touches, okay? Um, when you aggravate or activate that endothelium, it activates the clotting cascade. That's why if you cut your arm and you expose that endothelium, that's what helps you to stop bleeding as that cascade gets activated. What you've done is activate this, but inside the body, which is why you're starting to have these small clots that form in the body, okay? This is happening everywhere. So you get this endothelial activation and clots form. Um, it also is an immune system activator. So if I cut my arm, have y'all seen the Woodstock 
Have y'all seen the Woodstock documentary that's on Netflix right now about Woodstock 99? Really? Yeah, one person has seen it. Perfect. Thank you, Blake. Um, it was a disaster. I mean, they, there's there's pictures in there of like dudes in the 90s and they're like sliding through mud and they're like, yeah, Woodstock, except that it's not mud. It's runoff from the porta potties. It's disgusting. <laughs> so anyway, let's say you cut your arm and you're at Woodstock or whatever and you're sliding through the mud having a good time. OK. Your arm's going to get infected. That cut where you you have that injury, it's going to get inflamed and red and swollen. The reason that it's getting inflamed and red and swollen is because your body goes, there's an infection here and I need to get immune cells to it. I'm going to open up the blood vessels around it to allow those immune cells into the area to fix the problem. Okay, that's a good thing. That's going to keep you from getting gangrene in your arm. Um, the problem is when you have cardiac arrest, you activate this everywhere. Okay, this is distributive shock. Right. This is the same kind of shock you're going to see when you have sepsis. OK, this is like a, like an anaphylaxis type thing. Everything's going to open up. Also responsive to pressors, but also responsive to fluid. So when you have these post arrest patients, you got to figure out, is this cardiogenic shock because you treat that a certain way versus is this a distributive shock? OK, this is responsive to fluids and it's responsive to pressors. We can fix this problem. OK. Um, I'll tell you something that I didn't do a lot of when I was a medic is I didn't focus a lot. I focused a lot on systolic blood pressure, um, and I, I think it was taught a lot that way. And as I transitioned, you know, from paramedic to ER physician, I focus a lot more now on the mean arterial pressure, the MAP. Um, that really is a, a great picture of, of how the tissues are perfusing. And so I, I would say start to focus on that MAP. It's a much easier target to hit. Um, especially when you're given pressors, you really want that map to be above 65. Um, you know, you want to start to titrate that stuff down as soon as they can maintain that on their own. You do not want a map of 180 because they're on pressors, right? So this is not a more is better kind of thing. This is, you know, keep them above 65. If they can maintain that on their own, start to titrate them down, okay? The pressors that we're getting on the truck, we're going to have to get comfortable moving that little dial up and down. That's how they work, OK? All right, and finally, uh, we have to address the pathology of the event that incited this whole issue. And, and, and I'm not talking about the H's and T's. That's a thing that, that certainly you need to address and has to be addressed. But the H's and T's are to reverse cardiac arrest. That is to get you to ROSC. Now we have to figure out where the heck we're going to take you and what we're going to do with you. Um, having said that, Heart attacks account for 50%, so half of all these people that have an arrest in the field, it's because of a heart attack. 10% more because of a pulmonary embolism, so that's 60% right there. The rest of the scattered stuff, sepsis, overdose, respiratory failure, intracranial bleeds, metabolic disorders, there are other things. Um, but we really emphasize that a big part of this is cardiac, and that's why we really want you to get a 12 lead and send a 12 lead as early as possible because we want that cath lab to know as soon as they can to go ahead and get activated and get rolling. Um, super interesting study. So if you get this person and you get a heart rate back and you put a 12 lead on them and it shows a STEMI, perfect. You know exactly what you need to do. You got to get into a cath lab, right? No brainer. What this study looked at was basically like, what if they don't have a STEMI? What if it doesn't look like a STEMI? Well, it, as it turns out, about a third of the patients who got ROSC and did not have a STEMI and then went to the cath lab, so 33% of those patients also still had a heart attack, even without the EKG changes that we would typically see, okay? So of those patients, they did twice as well as patients who did not get early intervention. So even though their EKG looks normal, that is not an indication to just bypass the cath lab. Now, if they clearly have another uh, reason for having their arrest and they have a normal EKG, hey, that's fine. Hey, I think this person is septic or hey, this person you know, has bad asthma and arrested because of that. Cool, they don't need to go to the cath lab. If it's unclear, the, the 
prevailing thought right now is to err on the side of caution and bring them up to the lab if they're unresponsive and look at it there. Um, the American Heart Association last updated those guidelines in 2015. I think they're due for an update, I think every 10 years or something like that. But um, that basically what they say is, if they're having a STEMI, bring them to the cath lab. If they're not having a STEMI, but you think it's cardiac, also bring them to the cath lab, okay? Um, one of the benefits of getting them to the cath lab earlier is that they also have, um, they have additional interventions. So this is ECMO. Um, the ECMO machine basically takes the work of the heart and lungs away and lets a machine do it, okay? So it oxygenates and circulates the blood through the rest of the body. Um, this is how they do heart transplants and lung transplants and things like that. Um, they can initiate this therapy from the cath lab if that facility also has an ECMO team, okay? Not every facility that has a cath lab has an ECMO team, but I would generalize and say that every facility that has an ECMO team almost certainly has a cath lab, okay? Um, this is not a thing that I do in the ER. Um, you know, when I was at UAB and we would cannulate people for ECMO, there's phone calls that have to be made and you go, I got someone I think needs to be on ECMO and they bring a team of people down and they've got carts. I mean, it's, you know, have y'all ever seen the setup for Talladega when they bring in the, the big 18 wheelers, all the haulers come in? It's like that. I mean, they, all these carts are coming into the room. Um, it's a big deal. Um, this is probably the biggest tube that you can put in a vessel in a person's body. I don't know that it gets much bigger than that. Um, and this is not, this is not definitive treatment. This is just a bridge to therapy. And so I say, that's great. We can put you on ECMO and then that'll get us to, you know, where we can place some stents or do whatever it is we have to do. Um, but it's not, it, it's, it's a therapy that needs to be available. So, um, that kind of sums up the four things that we can attack for that PCAS. Are there any questions about sort of the physiology or like what, you know, what happens? Because I think once we understand like these are the things that happens, it's like it's easier to understand what you need to do in the field to fix that stuff or, or at least have a better outcome. Questions about that stuff? Cool. All right. So let's talk about what what kind of is on the horizon, what the future is going to look like a little bit. Um, you know, the, uh, the policy statement here is that they are trying to get, you know, people to the cath lab early. They're trying to get them to ECMO earlier. Um, yeah, that's all I was going to say about that. So just to readdress um, those are sort of the, the fixes to the things that we talked about. And again, you got a one in five chance that your patient is going to rearrest on you. Like Ferg said earlier, be ready, have them on the pads, take that opportunity to get IVs or IOs set up, have your meds ready to push and be thinking like, what am I going to do next if this happens? Okay. Um, this is a proposed algorithm from a paper last year. Um, that basically um, that basically advocates for a a ROSC system. So, like we have a trauma system, we have a stroke system, we have a STEMI system. What they really want to do is establish a ROSC system. So you can make a phone call like we do now and say, "I've got a post arrest patient," and they can direct you to a facility that is able to provide a cath lab or ECMO. But the important thing is to provide standardized care because there's a wide variation in the kind of care people get in the hospital after this. And it's a really hard thing to know if we're getting better at if we're all doing different stuff. OK, um, and so this is kind of one of the things on the horizon is, you know, in the next decade or so, you may be able to make a phone call and say, I have this patient. I got ROSC, um, you know. And they may ask you, do you think this is cardiac in nature or something else? And if you say, I don't know, then the default should be, we'll take them to this place that has cath lab and ECMO in these facilities. And you can bypass other hospitals at that point to get them to the right place. Make sense? Um, and this is some, some interesting and some new therapies that um, I think are up and coming in the future. So this is in Europe. 
And this is, uh, you know, he's a young man who was a drowning victim, but they're actually cannulating for ECMO in the field. Um, so they've got some doctors and some medics out there. And this is, uh, anyone know what building that is? I'd be super impressed. You'd be very fancy. That's the Louvre in Paris. But they're cannulating for ECMO on a guy that arrested in the Louvre. And, and this has been a study that they've done in Paris, I think, since 2014. And it's showing some promising results that um, we're shifting from a scoop and go situation to a stay and play. And so what they've done, and, and their, their system is set up very different from the way our system is set up in the US. And so they have strong physician input at nearly every level of the activation of pre-hospital care. So they've got a physician that screens the dispatch calls and helps to you know, provide the right resources. They've got essentially three tiers of resources. They can send the, uh, the firefighters, which are all like EMT basic equivalents over there. They've got ambulances that have medics on them, and then they have these mobile ICU units that have physicians on them. And so based on the dispatch, they allocate resources depending on what the call sounds like. So if it sounds like it's an arrest or you know something that will need an ICU, instead of scooping and going like we do in, as medics, they say, we're just gonna bring the ICU to you and we'll get you stabilized where you are. Once you're stable, then we'll pick you up and we'll move you somewhere else. And so they have this mobile ICU team that will show up and the mobile ICU team can go, oh, we've got ROSC, we need the ECMO team. And they've got a separate ECMO team that can either drive or fly to these places. It's it's pretty high speed stuff, but um, there's been a lot of promise in some of the therapies that they're doing by getting this ECMO performed early. Um, and basically, you know, once you do that, you take all the work off the heart and the lungs, and now you're oxygenating the body and the brain again. Um, another potential therapy coming up in the future, this is a Reboa, which we typically use in trauma. So it's essentially an internal tourniquet that goes inside the aorta. So not a vein, this is going in the artery. Um, and if y'all can see this balloon that's blown up in the aorta here, so that, uh, that keeps blood from going south anymore. So no more blood to the legs. And the idea is that increases the cerebral perfusion pressure while you're doing CPR. And so the idea is get these patients, shock them, throw a Reboa in, give them a slug of heparin, and then do CPR while you go to the hospital. So it's another potential therapy that's in the future. These are all things that are not standard of care, but are all being investigated to see if we can help kind of shift that curve, okay? Um, references of stuff that I looked up and put in here. Um, there's stuff like that that I wish that I had known, simple things, um, keeping the head of the bed at 30 degrees to help prevent, you know, intracranial pressure, stuff like that, that we can do uh, when we get these ROS patients and, you know, titrating the oxygen. Um, ultrasound is going to be up and coming. Um, that That is going to be standard of care, in my opinion, in the next five to 10 years. Um, you know, if you're going, is it cardiogenic shock or is it a distributive shock? I mean, that's a question the ultrasound will answer for you quickly. You put that on there and you look at their heartbeat. If it has a good squeeze, cool. I'm working with a distributive shock. I need to get fluids and pressors. If you throw that ultrasound on there and their heart look weak and it's not pumping well, hey, I'm dealing with cardiogenic shock. I need to give some, you know, dopamine, dobutamine, something like that to get that heart pumping a little bit better. Cool. Questions? I didn't mess y'all up with the cell membrane picture, huh? All right. Questions? Questions online, Wes? I got a. I was writing questions down as I went, but every question I wrote, you answered before I could finish typing it. So thanks for making me type for no reason, sir. Um, <laughs> so I, I think one of the things he said was great: the resuscitation centers. We've been pushing that for a long time. Resuscitation is a, a specialty just like trauma or peds or OB. So I hope in the future we can move that direction. Um, there's still folks out there that like to chill people, hypothermia, some don't. Mm -hmm. um, but if we don't have these centers, we can't look at all the data and figure out what's going on with that. And I say that now because the CARES registry is out there that you guys can participate in. Um, any transporting agency in the state can do it. It's paid for already by the state. 
please, we're not doing it, participate in that. If we don't standardize what we're doing and then go back and look at it, we can't say what we're doing is good or bad. So we're just kind of shooting in the dark, as you say, right? right. Um, so we got to do that. Um, and if you do your documentation and it's garbage, the data that we look at is garbage. So take the time to help us out, get the right data so we can make a difference. So we can say, yeah, if he's great at three minutes and 12 minutes, but not any other time. But if we don't have that data, we can't get any better with that. Um, what else do I think about? You mentioned the rearrest stuff. I agree. If you got somebody that's on the Lucas and you get Ross, don't take the Lucas off, put it back on the engine. Keep it on the patient, raise it up, turn it off. Because the odds of them going back and just needing that again, you got to keep that on there. I think that's about all I got. The other thing, you know, you talked about the European model. You know, they do have uh, more physicians out there. They also, their uh, baseline providers um, uh, getting more training and support on the medical side that we got to get better here. We just got to do that from a, from a physician side. Um, and then the other thing is with that, you talked about bringing ER care to the streets, and that's what we're already trying to do, right? So that's right. I guess my point to that is, is if you're an ALS provider and you got a cardiac arrest on the scene, don't load them up and try to do everything en route to the hospital. Spend a few minutes, manage the ABCs, do the care you can do right there. Uh, because how many of y'all see us in the ER if you've worked somebody 15 or 20 minutes and come in but haven't done a good job because you tried to get there quickly, do we actually work those very long or do a good job in the ER? I would argue we probably don't. Um, so we're trusting you to stay and play, manage these medical patients as best you can. And then when you need us or when it's time to come, come to us. Uh, but train, train, and work the codes where you find them. The other thing that you said was important to me was the causes of cardiac arrest. You know, 50% cardiac, another 10% PEA, I mean, uh, PE. Uh, so the reason somebody dies is the way we should treat them. So, for example, if someone dies from an opioid overdose, respiratory arrest, obviously we're going to do high-quality chest compressions, IV access, get a line in them. But we need to be aggressive airway managers on those patients, right? Because they die from a respiratory problem. They probably need to be intubated and ventilated of that nature versus the guy who just went into V-fib from a STEMI. He needs CPR, early defibrillation, and transport quickly to definitive care. So think about what killed the person in front of you and try to fix that problem. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? That's all the points that I got. Mm -hmm. I'll quit talking. Yeah, the, the other thing I would point out, and um, – for everybody to realize is a lot of the the data that Dr. Eversolt showed is national data, but there's extreme outliers, mm -hmm. extreme outliers. So your your probability of survival of cardiac arrest in the United States is most determined by where you are when the cardiac arrest happens. So what does that tell us? That tells us that if we train in our local agencies and we put together a good system for cardiac arrest management, we can dramatically improve not only the ROST numbers, but also the survival to hospital. And we've demonstrated that here in Alabama with, with several agencies that we can get a system together that's tailored for that agency. We're seeing ROSC rates around 50%, some of those agencies, and survival rate around 12%. Um, one thing that the American Heart Association has published for years, and you showed it on one of your slides, was the chain of survival. And on that chain, the CPR says to buy time at the bottom. And wow, I disagree with that because we're seeing so many successful resuscitations that are never defibrillated. So if they're not defibrillated, what resuscitated the patient? CPR. CPR is not just to buy time. CPR is what you do to resuscitate patients. So um, I think there's a lot of room to improve. To me, it's very exciting uh, where we're heading with cardiac arrest resuscitation because there's so much we can do so much better than we've done in the past um hold on we got some comments and questions coming in here uh nope just thank you for uh for a great lecture uh for both dr eversoll and dr ferguson we really appreciate all the online participation today and the folks here in person if you're in person, please remember to scan one of the flyers and fill out our attendance form, even if you don't need to go on ed. Uh, it helps us track who attended. And if you're online, you can find that link on the um, um, in the chat box in the Q&A. Please hit that.
and uh, fill out the form. If for whatever reason, by your mechanism, you can't hit the link, you can send an email to alabamaemschallenge at gmail.com. You'll get an automated response that has a link to the form. The password for today's form for lecture is STEMI, S-T-E-M-I, all lowercase, STEMI. And Dr. Ferguson, you got anything else? Uh, just once again, thanks Mobile Fire and Rescue for having us down here. We appreciate the Fire College sponsoring us. Um, if you're in Birmingham and did not drive to Mobile, there's a cadaver lab going on right now that's free of charge. Dr. Evans is running that for EMS Challenge. The information is on Eventbrite. That lab is also tomorrow afternoon and all day Friday. So it's free. Just sign up, get your spot. We can do that. And we'll see you the second Wednesday of next month. That's right. Yeah. Second Wednesday of next month. We'll be back. Thanks, everybody, for participating. See you next time.